D's get degrees, and now I look like I'm super educated. So this is this is great. Ava, can you join me on the uh, on the stage? We're starting this new series, right, called Sabbath, and uh, one of the uh, one of the reasons was like Sabbath is hard. And uh, back in the day, Ava was like, "Yo, I I work and I serve at the church, and you're telling me I need to take a break." And uh, even she knows, like, in our house, like, she can't get sick because everything falls apart. Uh, and so, uh, so that's, that's that. Uh, like last night, yeah. Uh, I slept through a whole bunch, I guess. So uh, anyways, uh, so uh, I just wanted you up here uh, with your calculator. Uh, and, uh, and honestly, like, Ava represents everybody in this room. Like, when we talk about Sabbath and a 24-hour break, you're like, <laughs> cute. Uh, and so, uh, so anyway, so like 24, you have your calculator? Okay, 20, 24 uh, times, times 7. What, what, is, what is that? Because it's 24 hours in a day, right? Uh, still? 168. Huh, what? 168. 168. So like, so that's like, we all have that, right? That's a fixed number. Uh, but if you went with like what the experts say that you should do in a given week, uh, or if you were just trying to be average, and let's just say like, hey, if I'm an expert or I'm average, uh, let's see, the uh, average uh, commute is about uh, five hours a week, uh, give or take. Uh, and so if we, uh, so 168 minus uh, 45, if you, you know, work, a, if you work. Uh, so what, what number is that? 123. You have 123 hours after after you work. So that's great. Uh, and so uh, then, what? What? Huh? What do you mean nine? What? What? What did I do? Five times seven, four, five times five, twenty. What are you talking about? Five hours. No, no. It's in total for the week. For the week, forty-five. It's like, yeah, yeah. For five hours is the average in a week commute. Don't Google it. Uh, so, uh, anyways, so uh, and then a Forbes, a Forbes article said uh, that in a given, uh, given week, seven days, uh, that we should have a hobby of about, tw- uh, that average is about 22 hours for the week. Okay, that's nice. Uh, so, uh, what's 20 minus 22? 29. 101. Okay, so uh, so if you have the hobby that a, a Forbes article says that you should have, uh, then uh, we all want to be healthy, and so uh, we want to sleep. Uh, and so if we slept uh, 58 hours uh, the given time, 56 hours, uh, how, uh, how much would that be? 101 minus 56? 45 hours. Ooh, okay, we're getting tight. Uh, okay, and then if we worked out, if we were healthy uh, physically, we should, we should work out uh, 18 hours uh, in a given week, according to the cardiovascular heart uh, whatever association.org or whatever, says that your, your heart rate needs to be elevated for about uh, 18 hours a week. Yeah, cray cray, right, Ava? Uh, and so if you were to minus uh, 18, what, what do we have after that? 27, okay. Uh, and then uh, uh, because uh, we need to work out because we eat, uh, and so if we spent time eating, that's about 11 hours a week. How much uh, do we get there uh, after 27 minus 11? I would argue more people okay. eat than they eat. Yeah, yeah, I know, but okay. 16. Uh, okay. Oh, hey, and this is a room full of some Christians, right? Uh, and so what if we spent three hours a week in prayer? Uh, you can't say no. I'm the pastor. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> 13. Uh, and what if we read our Bibles for three hours a week? What would that be? 10. Okay, great. Uh, and then uh, what, if, um, what if we attended a group? Josh just talked about groups. And so like travel time and whatnot, we, we'll spend two hours a week in a group, uh, two minus 10. Uh, D's get degrees, I can do it. Uh, eight. And, uh, and then what if we, we served? Like, what if we served and, like, two hours a week, okay? Uh, so, two, da, 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 carry the one, uh, six. Uh, and, uh, and then what if also uh, we went to church? Church is roughly an hour, but then you add travel. We, we get down to another, uh, another six, and now we're going to go up here. Now we, we're left, after being a Christian, uh, we're left with four, four hours a week of disposable time if we're average or if we do the experts. But, but then here's, Ava, here's where I need, I need the calculator again. Um, if we do some of the things that average Americans do, uh, could you uh, minus 21 from four? Because uh, that's the average amount of time people watch uh, TV. What is it? Negative what? 17. Negative 17. Okay. But then do you know the average American uh, spends uh, 37 hours a week on their phone? Uh, and so can you minus uh, 30, 37 from there? 20. Wow, that's, D's get degrees, don't agree. Uh, 54. 54 hours a week. My point in doing this, 
uh, fancy, <laughs> is negative 54 hours a week just by being average. <laughs> and we wonder why we're running, we feel like we're running at a deficit. <laughs> you, you guys walk in here tired uh, and just by being average. <laughs> uh, and like, what's going on? And so when we talk about this, this Sabbath thing and taking a 24-hour break, you're like, a 24-hour break? Uh, homeboy, <laughs> I'm fighting for an extra 54 hours uh, in, in my week. Uh, thank you, Ava. You can, you can have, uh, have, a, have a seat there. And uh, so we're doing this, this series on, on Sabbath. <laughs> and I think if this is anything, like, this is like, this is a needed series, is it, is it not? <laughs> uh, is anybody else kind of like Ava where you're like, hey, like I'm trying to run like a household, I'm trying to work, my boss is like, hey, I got I to gotta put in a little extra time, uh, my commute is this, uh, I, I have a hobby that re- demands this, I want to be healthy, I want to serve the church, I want to be at church, I want I to do, do all of these things. But how do I do it? And so, Jason, when you talk about Sabbath, Jason, aren't, aren't you kind of like out of reality? Uh, Jason, like, could you, could you join us back in reality with like, well, like, like 24 hours? Like, Jason, this, this doesn't make any sense. And we haven't even talked about kids, sports, chores, uh, marriage, date night, things of those nature. We're, we're about to celebrate two years, uh, celebrate, that's the completely wrong word, uh, we're about to, we're on the two-year anniversary of COVID, and, uh, and, and we're back to being just as busy as we were before COVID. How many of us got like a month or two in and we're like, yeah, COVID sucks, but I really like the extra time that I've gotten. <laughs> It forced me to slow down. Many of us said that, but here we are now post-COVID, perhaps. Like some people are saying we're out of COVID. That's not true, but like whatever. They're saying it, but they're wrong, whatever. And so here we are thinking that we're out of it again, and we're just as busy as we once were. We're trying to handle life as we used to try to handle life. We're adding God's voice into our life as just one of many voices. I'm, I'm trying to handle life as if I'm God and I welcome God in as a consultant. Maybe God as a consultant is better than most, but is that best? Did God die to be a consultant in your life? Because if he died to be a consultant in your life, then all the burdens of this world fall on your shoulders. And we walk in here and out of here with a heavy burden to bear. And so here's kind of how I want to start this series. <laughs> Could we all together, on the count of three, make one declaration together that I am not God? <laughs> okay, okay, on the count of three, let's all say together, I am not God. Ready? One, two, three. I am not God. So stop trying to be God. <laughs> it's not a shoe that you can fill. Uh, and so if we were to look up this, uh, this thing on uh, Sabbath, you could Google. Uh, Google gives a lot, has a lot to say, and you can Google definitions. And so here's the definition of Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath, a day of religious observance and uh, uh, abstinence from work kept by Jewish people on Friday evening to Saturday evening, the, uh, and most Christians on Sunday, uh, a supposed annual midnight meeting of witches uh, with the devil. Uh, so we all understand Sabbath, we can go home. Uh, it is, uh, when I saw that, I was like, man, Google, you've never failed me until now. Uh, and so uh, here's, what, here's what we would like to say. Uh, you can take out your cameras. If you have your go, your go deeper guide, here's a point where you guys can take a note uh, in that sermon section. Here's a, here's a definition that we're giving for Sabbath. Uh, a verb, uh, something actionable, uh, to cease my efforts for a day, to persist in my relationship with God. It's, it's to stop doing something with a purpose. Where there's a day where, where I remind myself by my inactivity that I am not God. And there's a God who desires a relationship with me. Uh, and so to start this series, we're going to turn to Matthew uh, chapter 11. Uh, you, can, you can scroll through the Old Testament, get to the New Testament, and it's the very first book. Matthew, if you hit Mark, you've gone too far. Uh, or you can Google. Google won't fail you on this one. Uh, Matthew 11 uh, ESV, and it will pull it up there as well. Here's what it says in, uh, in verse 25. At that time, uh, Jesus declared, uh, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such is your gracious will. 
Jesus is talking, and he, and he acknowledges that God is in complete control, that God Almighty is, we would use a churchy word, word called, called sovereign. He is in complete control of everything that goes on. Everything is under his control and his sovereign will. But then he uses two terms that we would think are contradictions, and there's, a, there's almost like a, a comparison there. The wise and the learned. He, he's sarcastically referring to those who feel like they are intelligent in their own eyes, ignoring and not relying upon God's wisdom, God's knowledge. They're relying on their own. But then, then, then but, so that's not to say here's because some of you guys aren't D's get degrees. <laughs> some of you guys are like super smart. You know words that I didn't even know exists. Like you were doing all the math without a calculator. Good for you. Uh, uh, and so uh, God does not discard uh, smart people uh, from heaven. <laughs> what Jesus is saying right here is that it's intellectual pride <laughs> that will keep some people out of the kingdom of God. <laughs> And he refers to others as little children. And in some translations, it might be babe. It's those that have innocently received the revelation, uh, the knowledge of God. And what he's referring to with these things is contextually the kingdom of God, heaven, eternity. And so there's this contrast that Jesus sets up between the wise and the learned and, and children. This, is, this, is, uh, this isn't just, hey, the knowledgeable and those that aren't so knowledgeable. This isn't about the educated and the uneducated. This isn't about the brilliant and the simple-minded. This is about those that think they can save themselves and those that know they can't. This is about those that are relying on their own efforts and those who rely upon God. And so we get to this point where you and I might say yes to this as Christians. We know that we are helpless we come to him in humility. We've repented from our sin. We've turned from broken ways. And we're now we're following the path of God. And it's in those moments where we've accepted truth and we then meet Jesus. He, he helps us in these next, this next uh, our steps forward. So this past week on Tuesday, my family should really avoid me on Mondays and Tuesdays because that's when I prep for this sermon. Uh, and they uh, always become a sermon illustration if they do anything on a Monday or a Tuesday. Uh, but so anyways, here I was with Brady uh, early uh, in the morning. He's doing his devotionals. He's, he's reading uh, right now. He's like reading through uh, John 18. Uh, and uh, Jesus is at, is at the garden and we're talking through it. He read it and we're, and we're talking through it. And uh, he's, uh, he's a little confused by uh, a statement that, that Jesus made about like, being arrested and not losing anybody. And, uh, and so he's like, Dad, what does that mean? I was like, well, it's prophecy. I was like, well, do you, like, do you, know, do you know what prophecy is, Brady? And he like thinks for a second, and he's like, uh, it's like a, a lot of profit. I was like, no, buddy, like, I, I mispronounced that word then. Uh, it's not prophecy. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not like a lot, uh, an abundance of money. No, but no, buddy, this is something from the past that was said and now is coming true in the present or that will come true uh, in, in the future. And so, uh, and so there was this prophecy where Jesus, where he wouldn't lose his 12, his 12 disciples in that moment. And so he, that's why he's saying, hey, arrest me, leave these guys, guys alone. Uh, and I was okay. He's like, oh, okay. Uh, and so then, and then he's talking about like, well, he said like, well, shall I not drink this cup? And Brady was like, what, what is Jesus trying to, trying to say there? And I was like, well, he's making a statement that he's going to be obedient. And Brady was like, well, is he isn't he asking a question? I was like, yeah, but it's a rhetorical uh, question. So it's a question? No, it, it's a statement. And, and then, like, who's on first? Like, talking to a, to a nine-year-old about a rhetorical question uh, and prophecy. But, but he accepted it. And then I got to the point, I was like, hey, so Brady, what does this mean for your day? <laughs> and he, he thought for a second, and, and then he concluded with, following Jesus means that we have to accept the hard thing and do the hard thing, even if it costs our lives. <laughs> and I was like, dude. <laughs> Good job. The whole church is going to know what you just said. Uh, I said things that right now, if you were to ask Brady, uh, what's a rhetorical question? He won't be able to tell you. A, he doesn't even remember. He couldn't, he couldn't articulate prophecy. But a daddy gave him information. He just trusted it without really knowing it and then drew a conclusion. I've read uh, a lot of the Bible, and I've drawn some conclusions without fully understanding God. How could any human mind fully understand God? <laughs> but I've drawn certain conclusions. 
where I have proven that I couldn't and he proved that he could. I, have, I know that I can't, but that he can. I know that I am in need and that he is what I need. I know that I am not God and that he is God. I know that I am not Savior, but he is my Savior. I know that I am a child, but he is the Father. And so I read God's word, I humbly accept this, and then I draw conclusions that help me in my relationship with God. My question as we start this series about Sabbath is why do we stop living out these truths and thinking and assuming that we are God when we've accepted the core of our salvation is that we can't and he did. (laughs) And so Jesus goes on and says, all things have been handed over to me by my father and no one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal. This is an intense statement where the Son of God is making a statement in front of other human beings saying, I am the Son of God. This is a statement of deity. I know the Father, and if you want to know the Father, I'm going to be the one to show you. You know the Father through me. The Father Father God is revealed alone through Jesus. In his mercy, in his goodness, he wants to be revealed. If God wanted to be a secret, he would never have sent Jesus to earth. And yet we respond not with, we shouldn't respond with indifference to that truth. We should respond in faith that God and Jesus share this unique relationship. And when you and I understand that relationship, truly for all that it is worth, We accept it in faith. We join in that relationship. And so that uh, blasphemy is like uh, committing an an offense uh, at the highest level. And so this is where we get blasphemy. That to reject this relationship, to understand this truth. Here, you understand, you will know this knowledge because you're sitting in this room. You will be accountable now before God for what you have just heard. Now to reject it, God will see it as blasphemy because it's offensive to him to reject the son and reject knowing God now that we know that this is before us. And when we accept it, when we say, hey, I'm not committing blasphemy. I I accept this in faith. I am part of this relationship. Then we become a follower of Jesus because here is what we are declaring that we know. We know the life-giving nature of the Father. We know the life-giving nature of the Son. And we have life-sustaining power of the Holy Spirit when we've accepted the relationship and become part of the relationship that God Almighty shares with Jesus and he wants to share with us. In a few weeks, I am uh, going uh, to Minnesota. Uh, Why do people go there in March? I I do not know, but there are flights to Minnesota. And uh, uh, because I I was uh, selected, I don't know if that's the right word, but I got uh, uh, Scott Rideout is the president of Converge. He oversees uh, hundreds and hundreds of churches. We, we are part of like-minded churches uh, that preach the gospel, and uh, it's called Converge, and so there's like five or six districts. There's churches all over the world. Uh, they're right now giving us information about how we can be supportive of churches in the Ukraine. Uh, it, it, is, it is worldwide, uh, and so he's the president of, of all of it. And, uh, and so I, I got an email saying, hey, uh, Scott Rideout wants to take 10 to 12 people uh, and mentor them for two years and coach them. And I'm like, hundreds and hundreds of pastors, and, and I just, I knew the right person to get a seat at the table. <laughs> it was nothing special. It was just, I knew the right person. Uh, and so I, I just got, the, I'm going out there, I'm going out to Minnesota, and uh, uh, to, to, for like two and a half days to be just uh, poured into by the, the president of Converge, uh, Scott Rideout, uh, and I'm a peon. And, uh, and, and then, they, so I got this email, uh, and they're like, hey, for fun, one night, uh, we're, uh, it's Minnesota. Uh, and so I don't even know if they speak like that, but I'm, that's how I envision it. And, uh, and, uh, and we're going we're gonna to go curling. And I'm like, that is rad. Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't, like, I'm from New Hampshire, and I know how to bowl. So, like, cold and bowling, it's, like, all the same thing, right? Uh, and so, like, I don't know what winning at curling is, but I know I'm going to win. Uh, and I know, like, if, if Scott Rideout is, is attempting to beat me, I know that one of those pucks or whatever is going to go get, like hit him in the knee f- accidentally. Uh, and so uh, I'm kidding. Uh, seriously. Uh, but uh, so like, uh, but I'm going to do that. Well, I get to see the table. Um, my, my point is this, like 
I, I now like literally have Scott's number and I can text him, the president of Converge. <laughs> Uh, a guy named Lee Stevenson has mentored me, and he oversees all of church planting for Converge. I can text him right now. Pastor Ritter from Bayside Chapel is my pastor. I have lunch with him every single month. We were just texting this week about uh, the Antichrist, because as you wonder about it, I wonder about it too. And, uh, and I get to text him, and he responds. I, I get to have these relationships, and I get to take them seriously, because I know that these three individuals that I just mentioned, they can't pour their lives into everybody. <laughs> Humans have limitations, don't they? But I get to have a relationship with them. And so if I were to treat those relationships as whatever, if, I, if, I, if I'm taking my time with them, if, I, if I'm there in that group meeting, if, I, if I'm there at lunch with Pastor Ritter and I treat it as whatever, then I'm treating them as whatever. One of our values here at, 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 at Wellspring is that we engage with God. That every Christian, like this is, this is supposed to be a tool to help us engage with God. You might have your own habits, great, but this hopefully is, is a tool. <laughs> we can talk about engaging with God, but, uh, and we can, we can maybe argue about it. We can maybe argue like how or what, or if we should engage with God, why would we argue about that? <laughs> the Lord of the universe <laughs> wants to engage with you. The Lord of the universe <laughs> desires <laughs> time with peon Jason. <laughs> the Lord of the universe sits on a throne, <laughs> but his throne is not foreign to me. <laughs> I get to engage with God. I don't need to go to some priest. <laughs> you don't need to come to me and say, hey, I want to talk with God. <laughs> cool, go do it. <laughs> Engaging with God is such an important value because it shows that we understand that Jesus wants time with us. Why would we ever take it for granted? And so here's where it gets real good, what, uh, what Nicole was reading earlier. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for what? Your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is really where it gets good. <laughs> Jesus is, is referring to something that they would understand this yoke where you would have two ox, oxen, oxen, ox, I don't know, whatever the plural is. Uh, you would have two oxen uh, that would come together. One would uh, initially would be stronger. One initially would know the, the master's voice, when to stop, when to go, heal, or I don't know what you use you, words you use for an ox, but uh, heal. Uh, and so like, you would know that like, the stronger one would be physically stronger, perhaps, but also would know the voices and the commands and when to go and when to stop. And, and then you would have a, a, another ox that wouldn't know those things, and so you would yoke it in. You would take a wooden bar, chain it in, and you would be yoked to a stronger one. And eventually, the two would become a powerhouse, when they both understand the commands, when they both have shared strength, and they're both plowing together, it's like this infinite amount of strength. But initially, the stronger one would help the weaker one to learn the master's voice and the master's commands. And what Jesus is saying here is he's making it clear. I'm the stronger one. Be yoked to me. Learn the Father through me. He's talking to a group of people that are just weary and burdened for all, from all the religious laws and regulations and, and the burden of religion pouring down on them. And he's saying, come to me. Give me everything and I will give you myself. I am the stronger one. Being yoked to Jesus is about living through Jesus, in Jesus, with Jesus on a daily basis. It's being yoked to Jesus where he walks with us and he, and he helps us through trials, tribulations, sufferings, trials, all of it. The Jesus that walks in here with us right now walks with Ukrainian Christians today. He walks with us. So we take advantage and we would look at it and we would say, hey, he's talking to a bunch of religious leaders. And, and so are we saying that, that believing in Jesus is like everything becomes easy, that, that all these rules and regulations just become, no, have you read the word of Jesus? <laughs> if you look at a woman with lust, you've committed adultery. If you have anger in your heart, you, you have committed murder. Jesus even elevates it and makes it even harder. <laughs> but he's completed it. <laughs> and the burden is still light. <laughs> the, the load that we bear is still light. Why? 
because we're yoked with Jesus. <laughs> we're not walking along with our own yoke. We're yoked to Jesus. He's given us the Holy Spirit <laughs> to walk every single day in the Spirit of God. And so the religious leaders in Jesus had the same burden, perfection and holiness. <laughs> But the Pharisees, you know what they said? You go do it in your own human strength. Jesus says, hey, you know what? It's still perfection and holiness, but go do it in the spirit of God because I've already completed and conquered this, this holy perfection for you. Now go be like the son. And so he's looking at a group of people that are weary and broken and saying, don't go back. What he's looking to you and I right now and saying, don't go back to obligation religion. Go back to I have to do, do, do so that God might like me. That sounds exhausting. Working for your salvation and working to keep your salvation. <laughs> Exhaustion is all you will ever find. <laughs> Jesus says, repent, find me. Here's the rest that I offer you that is eternal. <laughs> Trust Jesus. Come to Jesus, cease from all the self-help effort of trying to earn your salvation. Give me everything you have, and I will give you myself, and that is enough. Jesus is not bartering with us. He's not saying, hey, let's come to the table and make a negotiation. <laughs> I offer everything to you. You give me everything, and I'll walk with you through it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I see a counselor uh, once a month. I mentioned this. Mental health is important, so there's no shame in that game. And, uh, and so I see for a mental health checkup every single month, I go see Dr. Newenhouse. He'll never admit to seeing me because uh, he says it's illegal, but I don't really care. Uh, and so, uh, so I see Dr. Newenhouse. And, uh, and one, of the, the, one of the most timely uh, moments with him uh, was I walked in, and I was exhausted. And, uh, and uh, I he was talking to me, and I was like, yeah, like I, I, I go to bed at, you know, late at night, I'm, I've been, I kind of just work while I do this, and then I wake up early, and I work out, and I do these things, and I'm just like, I'm exhausted from all the, like, the church is growing, and this, that, and like, I'm just like painting this picture of exhaustion, and, uh, and he's like, um, well, how much, how much sleep do you get? I was like, I don't know, I, I probably get eight hours, and uh, I was like, well, uh, whatever, and uh, he's like, well, you, know, you have a Fitbit, okay, look at, look at your phone, and uh, so I, I pulled up my phone, and it, it tracks my sleep, uh, it's creepy, but whatever, it tracks my sleep. <laughs> And so I looked at it, I was like, oh, yeah, like I'm averaging like four and a half to like five and a half is like my average. Uh, and he's like, okay, um, well, clinically, that's sleep deprivation. Uh, and so uh, before you go spiritual places with where, where you think you're at, uh, maybe you should try to eliminate the physical. And uh, you just probably just need a little bit more sleep. <laughs> um, and you can't do it all, so why are you trying to do it all? Uh, and so uh, if you're part of my men's group, uh, I really love hanging out with you guys until eight. Uh, and then... <laughs> Uh, then you'll see my eyes get heavy, uh, knees weak, arms are heavy, okay. uh, you'll see, <laughs> 90s, uh, and so, uh, like, uh, like, so I go to bed, uh, no shame in that game, I go to bed early, and I wake up early, and because I make a commitment to getting more than six hours of sleep, uh, because what that taught me from a spiritual uh, situation, or whatever I'm dealing with, is that when I'm not getting enough sleep, I'm trying to be God, <laughs> I'm trying to do way too much, and, uh, I'm not God, uh, and so I can, I can get a good night's sleep, <laughs> and that is okay because God has designed us to get sleep. Uh, you can go to Google, and you can uh, put in this term, sleep easy. Uh, sleep easy is to go to sleep <laughs> without worries. <laughs> you know, at the truest sense of this definition, when, it, when we put eternity into the equation, the Christian is the only one on planet Earth that can go to sleep without worries. Do we? Do we get salvation where Jesus has taken care of all of it for us? Do we understand when Jesus said that the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and life abundantly? We're just saying over and over again, why do I worry? God's not worried. If we understand the gospel message, we can go to bed without any worries. Take a stroll with Jesus. 
Take a day off and remind yourself you are not God and I get to be connected to God. Perhaps one of the best things, perhaps one of the best proofs that you understand the gospel message of Jesus Christ is that you get a good night's sleep and you take a day off. <laughs> Our big thought for this experience is simply this. We, when we find Jesus, we find the sleep easy life. <laughs> When we find Jesus, we find the sleep easy life. So are you trying to take control? Do you have the sleep easy life uh, in your life? Are you trying to earn, earn, earn? And have you said yes to Jesus, but now you're trying to earn it back, to trying to earn it so that he likes you. He already likes you. All the love that you could ever have was there at the cross. It is still there. You can stand before God and you're going you're gonna to stand before God and you're going to say, well, this, 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 I'm a good person because of this, 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 that's exhausting. We get to stand before God and say, that perfect son of God, the perfect son of God is in me. Amen. You'll never find perfection in me, but you'll find it in the son that lives in me. Jesus already proved he can handle it and he's yoked to you. So for perhaps some of us walked in here and you did walk in here with a bunch of religion. <laughs> a bunch of, Jason, I go to church religiously. <laughs> Jason, I watch TV evangelist religiously. <laughs> Jason, if I stand before God, I'm going to tell him about how many times I read the Bible over religiously. <laughs> I got the Bible app. I got the kids app. I got every app. <laughs> I, I watch it all, 24-7. Spotify, oh, I got every playlist, Jason. That's what I'm going to, I do, 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 do. Awesome. Have you ever accepted what's been done for you? So I'm going to not close. I want to say just one more thing, but I want to pray real fast. And for anybody that's walked in here with the burden of religion and have, has never accepted the, 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 the light load that Jesus offers you, not that it's easy to be a Christian, because we're still following Jesus. <laughs> we're, st we're still saying, oh, yeah, that hateful heart that I have is not good, and I'm yoked to Jesus, so this is getting a little uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm going to change. <laughs> it's not easy, but we're yoked to somebody that's helping us. <laughs> so I want to just quickly pray and, and just share just one more quick thing. God, I pray right now for anybody that is, is super religious. Um, Father, I, I thank you that their super religious nature brought them here. Uh, but Father, I pray that they would leave their religion at the door. And that they would embrace a relationship with you right now. Father, the one that looked at the checklist and said, I did it all. <laughs> Come to me. <laughs> Come to me. So if that's you, it's simply praying something like this. God, as I've tried to be perfect, I haven't been. <laughs> I've not been perfect. I've tried checking every box, but I've already failed. <laughs> and I am sorry. I want to be different. I want to be yoked to your son, and I want to live more like your son as we move forward. <laughs> and so I believe that Jesus died for me in my place, and I believe that he rose again because he's just, he proved he's more powerful than death. <laughs> and that only he can offer me eternal life. I believe it. I give you my life, Jesus. I am yoked to you. Help me be more like you. In your name, amen. amen. If you prayed that prayer, uh, please grab one of these on the way out. The aisle hosts um, will have them uh, for you. So just in closing, um, I, I was working through this this morning, and I was reminded of, uh, of the dude uh, that's standing right here uh, strumming the guitar. Um, and uh, something that he's done recently is, uh, uh, so Josh Raj, his, his mom and his in-laws are all traveling the world, so it must be nice. And, um, and so it's a good thing. Uh, but, but what it's left for uh, uh, the Raj is, is like, hey, we used to have free childcare uh, anytime we wanted. Uh, and that literally left the state. Uh, and so uh, there was just this extra burden on the family. And so uh, where Josh was able to serve on this team on a, on a nearly week weekly basis, uh, Josh was like, I need to quit it. I need to cut back. I need to stop doing that to better love my family. 
Uh, and so Josh is only serving uh, now twice a week, and it's, not, uh, it's for no other reason than Josh is a human being with limitations, and if he lives as if he doesn't have limitations, then he limits his family. So that's my challenge to you and I this week is, uh, is to quit something, <laughs> cut back on something. Because if everybody is important, no one's important. <laughs> if everything is important, <laughs> then nothing is important. <laughs> God made you with limitations, and so you're not a machine. <laughs> you might wake up and you might look at your spouse when you're looking at yourself in the mirror and say, Honey, I'm a machine. <laughs> You're not. Um, you have a free will and limitations. Uh, and so uh, you're striving to be a machine. That will never happen. Uh, and so uh, I challenge you uh, this week to quit something. You don't have to do everything. <laughs> so when you want to quit something, go to said person and say, my pastor said I need to quit. <laughs> I quit. <laughs> if there's a toxic relationship that is just like, whew, then you look at the person and say, my pastor said I need to quit something, and it's you. <laughs> I'll, and just when you get those, when they say like, well, can I email your pastor? Yeah, it's Graham at Wellspring. Got one. Um, and so... My challenge, in all honesty, is to quit something <laughs> and embrace that you are a human being and it's time to put the being, being with Jesus back into human being. <laughs> and so let's sing one more song. <laughs>